Hello guys, and welcome to my channel. Due to YouTube copyright infringement, we only use one picture with voiceover. Thank you for understanding. If you love history and biographies, please leave a like and a sub. Let's start the video. Walter Ruther was an American labor leader who built the United Automobile Workers, UAW, into a successful and progressive union, which campaigned not just for higher pay, but also on civil rights, women's rights, environmental concerns, and a worldwide democratic trade union movement. Ruther was considered one of time's most influential 100 people of the century. Ruther was born the 1st of September, 1907 in Wheeling, West Virginia. His parents were German-American, and his father was a committed union organizer and socialist. His father encouraged his children to take an interest in progressive and socialist ideas. As a child, the young Walter accompanied his father to visit the socialist leader Eugene Debs who was in prison for opposing the First World War. His father also taught his children to oppose racial discrimination. One day, local boys were throwing stones at black men being transported in an open railway wagon. His father told Walter and his brothers, you must never treat human beings unfairly because of the color of their skin. In 1927, he left his hometown to work in Detroit. He gained a high-paid job at the Ford Motor Company. He soon became viewed as one of best skilled mechanics, despite his young age and lack of experience. While working during the day, he enrolled at Detroit City College to further his education. While at college, he organized a protest against segregation at a local hotel, which only allowed its swimming pool to be used by white students, and not blacks. The arrival of the Great Depression and mass unemployment of the 1930s led Walter to become more politically active. He supported the candidacy of socialist Norman Thomas for the 1932 presidential election, and he tried to organize trade union activity. Henry T. Ford was vehemently opposed to ever accepting unions in his factories, and so in 1933, Ruther was fired implicitly for his left-wing political activism without a job in the U.S. Walter and his brother Victor embarked on a world tour. They arrived in Germany shortly after the Reichstag fire and saw Nazi stormtroopers beat and arrest political opponents. They then traveled to the Soviet Union, where they spent 16 months working in factories which were trying to learn the techniques of mass production pioneered in America. At the time, Ruther was sympathetic to the Russian Revolution, but he later said that he became frustrated by the inefficiency of the Soviet system and lack of freedom. The world tour also took them to Asia and Japan before arriving back in the US. Back in the US, Walter returned to Detroit where he became a leader of the UAW trade union. At the time, the union had very few members and were not properly recognized by the motor companies. Ruther led workers on strike at Kelsey Hayes. The strike was motivated by an intolerable increase in the speed of the assembly line. The workers struggled to keep pace, and accidents with loss of limbs were becoming frequent. In 1936, Walter led the workers in a sit-down strike until management agreed to meet. After 10 days, the motor company gave in and agreed to many of the union demands. It was a big victory for the UAW and membership soared from just 200 to 35,000 by the next year. In 1936, workers at General Motors in Flint, Michigan went on strike to force employers to recognize the union. Walter organized a sympathetic strike in Detroit at a plant which made car parts for GM's Cadillac. Despite fierce clashes between police and striking workers, the unions were successful in forcing GM to recognize the car workers' union. The strikes led by Ruther and others also elicited the support of many ordinary people. The Great Depression was a time of turmoil, with many living in poverty. When police started to use violence against pickets at a Chrysler strike in 1937, 150,000 local citizens came out to support the strikers. Ruther was an excellent speaker and gaining the sympathy of the wider public was important for shifting the balance of power.
and forcing the motor companies to recognize unions. The last motor company to resist unionism was Ford Motor Company. Henry Ford was resolutely opposed to dealing with unions, and he employed Harry Bennett to enforce his rule with violence if necessary. In 1932, Bennett's armed men and shot five workers dead at the Ford River Rouge Complex. In May 1937, Ruther began handing out leaflets on public property outside the same Ford River Rouge complex. The leaflet said unionism, not Fordism. Ruther had publicized his campaign, and many journalists came to witness the event. Bennett's men ruthlessly beat Ruther and kicked him down some steps. They then proceeded to rough up other union men and women. They tried to confiscate the cameras of the press, but one camera was sneaked out. The blooded picture of Ruther was published in Time magazine and became national news. The event became known as the Battle of the Overpass, and it shifted sympathy to the right of workers to unionize. It was also a period of real personal risk for Ruther. In 1938, gunmen barged into his home in an attempted murder. The attempt was thwarted by Ruther's friends and relatives. After four years of intense political pressure, Ford made a U-turn and agreed to allow unions the right to organize and collectively bargain with the company. In 1940, the U.S. was officially neutral in the Second World War, but U.S. industry was supplying planes and material for Britain who stood alone fighting Nazi Germany. Ruther felt the U.S. could do much more to provide military hardware. He made a claim that automobile production could easily be modified to produce aircraft and provide Britain with 500 planes a day. President Roosevelt was intrigued by Ruther's plan, and he invited him to, to the White House to discuss the plan. However, the main motor companies opposed the Ruther plan because they preferred purpose-built plants, and they were not happy a union leader was making suggestions about production. The plans did not happen until after Pearl Harbor when America joined the war. Former car plants were then successfully converted to produce wartime equipment and planes during the war. Ruther was very supportive of the war effort and discouraged strikes amongst Union members. However, after the war ended, he led demands for a 30% increase in wages to reflect the loss in real wages over the war period. The company refused, but after a 113-day strike the company agreed a record 18.5 cent an hour rise. Ruther also encouraged motor car companies to meet consumer demands. A UAW pamphlet entitled A Small Car Named Desire, urging Detroit to build cheap, Volkswagen-like compact cars, affordable to car workers. On the 27th of March, he narrowly won a vote to become president of the UAW. He narrowly defeated incumbent president R.J. Thomas, who was a communist. Ruther was now one of the most visible union leaders in the country. Despite supporting the Socialist Party in the 1930s, Ruther turned against communism, citing his experience in the Soviet Union and lack of freedom within communism. He was also impressed with how F. D. Roosevelt was seeking to tackle inequality and he joined the Democratic Party. In fact, Ruther became staunchly anti communist and his election led to a deep rift between rival factions within the UAW. However, after his narrow election win, the power and influence of the communists in the U.S. labor movement soon fell dramatically as the Cold War made communism the ideological enemy of America. Ruther set up the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions as a counterpoint to the communist-dominated world. Federation of Trade Unions However, despite his anti-communism, he was still viewed with suspicion and a dangerous progressive figure in American politics. In 1948, there was another attempt on his life. He was shot with a double-barrel shotgun and only narrowly survived after being hit in the arm and stomach. The next year his brother Victor was also shot and only narrowly survived. J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI, always tried to denigrate Ruther as a communist and refused to investigate the shooting. Both shootings were never sold. In 1952 he was elected President of Congress for Industrial Organization, CIO. 
In 1955, the CIO merged with the American Federation of Labor, AFL. George Meany became president of the AFL-CIO and Ruther was appointed vice president. Ruther and Meany often clashed with Ruther believing Meany too conservative. Ruther was influential in expanding the role and scope of union activity. He didn't want to just campaign for higher wages for automobile workers, but he saw the union movement as an opportunity to promote progressive political change in the whole of society. He felt that the car union should express solidarity with struggles for civil rights and women's rights. On a number of occasions, Ruther fought for equal pay for women workers. Ruther was also a prominent supporter of Martin Luther King. He joined King on civil rights marches in Selma, Birmingham and Montgomery and was a board of directors for the NAACP. When King was arrested in Birmingham, Alabama, Ruther raised the $160,000 for protesters to be released. In 1963, Ruther was a key figure in organizing the March on Washington. It was his suggestion to hold the march by the Lincoln Memorial, rather than directly outside Congress. He even paid for a sound system so that the speeches could be heard. Ruther and the UAW brought 5,000 members to the rally. Ruther was the most prominent white speaker at the event. In 1965, Ruther expressed solidarity with striking agricultural workers in California, led by Cesar Chavez. Ruther visited California and helped give national prominence to the strike and campaign to boycott grapes until workers gained union recognition. Ruther also offered financial support to the strikers and encouraged Robert F. Kennedy to support the strikers. The 1965 Delano Grape Strike was a major landmark in improving wages and conditions for agricultural workers. Ruther became an influential figure on the left-wing, liberal wing of the Democratic Party. He advocated for civil rights and also a welfare state and greater health care provision. During the 1960s, he frequently met with Lyndon Johnson to discuss upcoming legislation. Ruther was opposed to the Vietnam War and yet unwilling to speak against Johnson. He didn't want to antagonize the president who had the power to introduce domestic change. Ruther was also an early environmentalist. In 1965, the UAW held a clear water conference and corresponded with Johnson to pass legislation to reduce pollution. Walter also supported the Clean Air Act, 1963, something opposed by the big four car producers shortly before his death on the 22nd of April, 1970. Ruther and the UAW helped to organize the first Earth Day and gave $2,000 of support. The UAW also helped with the administration and even published materials criticizing pollution belching cars. On the 9th of May, 1970, Ruther died in a plane crash near Michigan, along with his wife, bodyguard, and three others. After surviving two previous assassination attempts, there was speculation it may have been an assassination. The National Transportation Safety Board investigated the crash, and they found the cause of the Pelston crash to be a combination of the pilot's inability to judge the aeroplane's altitude and bad weather. One and a half years before the fatal crash in October 1968, Ruther and his brother had been in a very similar situation. Both Ruther and his brother Victor were almost killed in a small private plane as it approached Dulles Airport. On that occasion, there was also a faulty altimeter. He married May Wolf, a physical education teacher, in March 1936. They had two daughters and lived in a modest Detroit home they purchased in 1941. 